Come, Holy Spirit, and kindle the fire that is in us. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and see through them. Take our souls and set them on fire. Amen. Preaching is an interesting enterprise, especially if your name is Dean Wolf and you've just heard a passage about the wolves taking the lambs. It's all complicated. If you're an Episcopal clergy person preparing a sermon, you read the lessons appointed for the week and you study them. You read the commentaries and you read the newspapers and you pray about the needs of your congregation. You try to determine what your listeners need to hear most. It can't always be just what they want to hear. And of course, you can't say the same things over and over again, even though you're bound to do precisely that. You won't be able to avoid being political, but you shouldn't be partisan. It's nice if you can throw in some humor from time to time, but you're not a stand-up comedian, and so you don't want to try to become one. You want to deal with the bigger questions, because that is what you and your people are dealing with, the big questions. And so then you begin. As human beings, one of the biggest and most soulful questions we can ever ask is, am I loved? Am I truly and genuinely loved? Because a lot of things hang on that. It's one of life's serious questions. How can you know the answer? We also ask, am I lovable? Or what is love? Or am I in love? And these are all important questions too, but am I loved? Well, now that's an essential question. That one cuts right to the bone. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we must discover the power of love, the redemptive power of love, and when we discover that, we will be able to make of this old world a new world. Love is the only way. But there's so much pious talk about love in the church. Christians speak about love all the time. We talk about loving God. We talk about how God loves us. We talk about loving one another as Christ loved us. We talk about loving our neighbors as ourselves. No doubt about it. We talk a pretty good game when it comes to love, but we too seldom speak about authentic love. We don't talk nearly enough about the repercussions of love or the complexity of it. We fail to address the parts of love where it becomes impossibly difficult or necessarily self-sacrificing or just completely inexplicable. We seldom talk about the price of love, the cost of love. And we're at a clear disadvantage in our communications because in English, the word love is often a soft and romantic word where we in English employ one word for love. Other languages, most notably Greek, use half a dozen. So there can be no mistaking the writer's intentions. But the English word love can also be a difficult, durable word. And it can be just as hard as the hard wood of the cross. Are we loved? How can we know? It's easy to be overwhelmed by all the reasons that we might find ourselves unlovable. We are too often selfish and often unkind. We are impatient. We can be ridiculous in so many different ways. We can be unforgiving and calculating, sometimes even cruel. 
God may not always like us, but God has promised to love us. And we don't seem to have much confidence at all in the power of confession. Does anyone believe they can truly be forgiven? We hold on to all of our imperfections so tightly. Our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, preached at the royal wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. He preached a wedding homily to more than 1.9 billion people, making it the third most watched event in human history. In it, he said, there's power in love. Don't underestimate it. Don't even over-sentimentalize it. There's power. There's power in love. If you don't believe me, think about a time when you first fell in love. The whole world seemed to center around you and your beloved. There's power in love. Not just in its romantic forms, but any form, any shape of love. There's a certain sense in which when you are loved and you know it, when someone cares for you and you know it, when you love, it actually feels right. There's something right about it. And there's a reason for that. The reason has to do with the source. We were made by a power of love, and our lives were meant and are meant to be lived in that love. That's why we're here. Ultimately, the source of love is God himself, the source of all our lives, end quote. Our dear brother Michael was right. And part of our need and desire for love and even our capacity for love comes from how we've been loved ourselves. Those of us who have been fortunate to be born into families who possess a great capacity for love, families who make certain their love is as certain and as clear as the North Star, come to realize what an enormous gift we've been given. And those of us who have been born into complex, angry family systems come to realize how hard we must work to obtain what may come so comparatively easy to others. We work extra hard to make certain our children have all the love we missed, all the reassurance we can possibly give them. Never let them go out the door without saying, I love you, I love you. When love comes wrapped in the form of a physically or more commonly emotionally abusive parent or relative who constantly repeats, I love you, I love you, in the midst of exhibiting the worst and most destructive behavior, it's difficult to trust that any love, even God's love, could be reliable or worth the risk. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Let's just be as straightforward as we can possibly be. It's really difficult to trust the love of God, isn't it? It's a high-stakes, no-holds-barred kind of love. He gives everything for us and invites us to do the same for one another. So no, this isn't that namby-pamby kind of love. This love is the real McCoy. Now, agrarian images are so much more difficult to understand in a culture which is no longer primarily agrarian, and the metaphor of the good shepherd requires a whole lot more interpretation in modern midtown Manhattan than it did in first century Palestine. Most of us don't know any shepherds. Even fewer of us have actually been shepherds. Am I right about that? <laughs> 
I mean, we can imagine, theoretically, the life of a shepherd just as we can imagine the life of an astronaut or a fortune teller. That is to say we can comprehend the work generally, but we will never understand the details or the subtle nuances. And if we attempt to shift the metaphor to something else like the good caregiver or the good overseer, then we lose even more in translation. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. These are his words. This is his description, his summary identity statement of who he truly is and what he truly does. Now, no doubt you've heard this story before. A mother takes her small son to the seashore. Boy, it's supposed to be a relaxing day, you know. She's laying in the sun, and he's playing happily with his small shovel and bucket, and all is well with the world. But suddenly, a huge wave rises up out of the ocean and sweeps over the beach and disappears, leaving not a single trace of the child. Well, the mother, upset, cries out to God, Oh, Lord, I love my child. Please, if you can find it in your mercy, return him back to me. And suddenly a large wave miraculously arose from the ocean and the child was deposited directly at the mother's feet, looking little worse for the wear. The mother briefly inspected the boy and then looking back into the heavens, she yells, he had a hat. <laughs> he had a hat. I love that story because it says so much about how we think about God. As children of God, we often display the patience of a child and the temperament of an infant. We expect God, our cosmic bellhop, our spiritual concierge in the sky, to jump at the opportunity to fulfill our every whim. A child is saved and we're left wondering where the heck is the hat? Our lives are infused with profound meaning and we're wondering when God is going to sufficiently prove God's self to us. We're virtually surrounded by the blessings of God and we wonder why we have been left so abandoned. This week, we've been confronted with the unimaginably horrific image of a man setting himself on fire in front of the courthouse where the trial of the former president is being conducted. Was it a protest, a cry for help, a last desperate act of a mentally ill person? We may never completely know the answer but when we see someone so bereft, so devoid of hope, that they think of the most terrible thing they can do to themselves and then do it, some piece of our own soul breaks. Our heart is ruptured by the suffering of others, and that too is a form of love. Our hearts go out to those first responders who will carry that experience for the rest of their lives. How can we show the sick, the mentally confused, the isolated, that God loves them too? Another preacher I've long admired, the Reverend Peter Gomes, once observed, God's love is a participating love such that he engages with us and in our behalf in the work and labor of the world. This action of God dignifies the whole creation by becoming a part of it so that we might participate with him in the making of a new creation. This is Christ's way of telling us in just one more way. We are loved. And this is how we can know love. 
one of the great human questions is, am I loved? And we've been given the answer to that question. Yes, you are loved. All y'all. But that question is almost always followed by, how can I know? Professor Gomes responded to that question too when he wrote, if God can invest himself and his love in the unlikely form of a man born of a woman who suffered as we suffer and died as we shall die, dare we invest less in humanity than God? Ought we not take a sign of God's love for us in Christ as a sign that we are lovable and the world is worth loving? And if that is so, can there be any possible limit to what we can attempt as God's representatives in the world? End quote. Now, there's another story that I heard in various forms probably a dozen times or more as I was growing up in the evangelical tradition. Some of you have no doubt heard it, but sometimes the old stories are the best ones. Two men were called upon in a large classroom to recite the 23rd Psalm. One was a famous orator, trained in speech and communications and drama, and the other was kind of a small town preacher. The orator repeated the psalm in a tremendously powerful way, and when he finished, the audience cheered him and even asked if he might repeat the psalm that they might hear his wonderful interpretation yet again. And then the preacher good deal older than the first man, stood up slowly and repeated the same words carefully, methodically, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And when he finished, he sat down and not one sound came from the classroom. Everyone was left in a mood of deep devotion and prayer And then the first man, that great orator, stood up and said, I have a confession to make. The difference between what you have just heard from my older friend and what you have heard from me is this. I know the psalm, but he, he knows the shepherd. My dear friends in Christ, all of you who are preparing for next week's visit from the bishop to be confirmed or received or reaffirmed, I invite you to come to know this shepherd. I invite you to discover you are loved more deeply than you will ever fully comprehend and to lean into that truth. I invite you to know for sure that you are loved because it was God who first loved you. It was God who first loved us all.